Hey, welcome back to my channel. This is Joel Duff, and today I do something called the alternate abstract. Here's where I've read a paper and I have found some what I think is intriguing and interesting data that is speaks to topics that I'm interested in and I hope that you as my viewers will also be interested in as well. But maybe the original authors didn't have the questions in mind that, that I have in my mind, right? And so I essentially rewrite their abstract. So we have the alternate abstract and maybe also an alternative title that's a little more sexy and grabby than the original authors intended. So today we have zombie cicada butt fungus has largest known fungal genome. This is the title I would have used for maybe if I were writing for Science News or Science Daily or something like that to report on uh, findings that come from the literature. All right, so let's take a look at zombie cicada butt fungus and their extremely large fungal genomes coming up. The genus magic the genus of cicadas called magic cicada. The magic cicadas. Alright. They're the 13 and 17 year periodical uh, cicadas. Uh, and in particular, we're going to we're talking about the cicadas that are the 17 on a 17 year cycle here in the eastern U.S. And you may have heard this story. It, um, it crops up every time a new brood comes out. And so recently had brood 10. Uh, I'm familiar with brood five, which was in our particular area of Ohio back in 2000. I believe it was 2017. I'll show you pictures of those in a moment. And uh, in every time these cicadas come out, there's these horror stories of cicadas that have their butts uh, you know, eaten off, all right, by fungi, uh, and then replaced by the uh, canidia, or which are the the spore forming portions of a fungus late in their late in their development. Uh, in which they then spread themselves to other cicadas. And so here you see a magic cicada being held up and showing that uh, almost a third of the cicada is gone, where its abdomen would be, and well, and, and importantly, its sexual organs, are completely been eaten away by this fungus. And now there's sort of this uh, white powdery stuff, which is hundreds of thousands of spores, uh, ready to be dispersed, um, and from the spores perspective, dispersed hopefully to another cicada where it will then begin to grow and its hyphae into the next cicada, dissolving its butt and event, you know, using the resources of the, the, the posterior end of the cicada uh, to complete its life cycle and then spread itself to another cicada. Uh, it's actually a rather a complicated life cycle but of course because of course cicadas come up every 17 years or at least in the final adult form uh, they do sexual reproduction and then lay their eggs and then the larvae hatch uh, from the little slits in the trees that they make and then the larvae fall to the ground and then burrow their way down into the ground where they're going to spend the next 16 years uh, gradually you know eating actually sucking uh, nutrients from roots uh, and very slowly going through their different uh, life stages there uh, until they're ready to uh, emerge once again. Um, and so there is this fungus which is attacking, among lots of other things that attack cicadas. And this cicada, um, this is a picture from the publication we're going to talk about in just a second. Um, this cicada then uh, has these uh, fungi and one of the ways that the fungus moves from one cicada to another is not just by, okay, release the spores out into the world and they float around and hopefully land on another cicada. No, they're a little more crafty than that. Um, there seems to be some evidence that, well, at least we can see the behavior and it appears that there is evidence that the behavior of the cicada itself is being manipulated uh, by the fungus and hence the zombie fungus thing, right? It's under the control of something else. Uh, the cicada is essentially the walking dead because it's one third of its body is gone and yet the cicada still walks around and flies and tries to reproduce except it can't reproduce. They're infertile because their sexual organs are completely gone been replaced by a fungus. So how do you think this fungus reproduces? Well, you know, how does it get from one cicada to another? It, in, it keeps the cicada alive. In other words, it doesn't dissolve the entire cicada. 
So that in itself is is an amazing accomplishment, right? That uh, some kind of genetic controls are preventing the fungus from continuing to grow into the parts that uh, would actually kill the, the cicada outright. And so the, 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 the fungal hyphae, right, the portion of the fungus that is a growing active cell, uh, remains um, down there just in the posterior end and allows the cicada to to survive and it walks around and flies and uh, tries to mate and then of course when it tries to mate it's not mating with its sexual organs it's trying to mate with this uh, fluffy white stuff which are a bunch of spores and then it scrapes spores on the next cicada therefore infecting the next cicada but it's even some of these um, these spores some of these fungi are even more amazing than that uh, some of them appear to uh, em emit some kind of hormone that makes the males all right the male cicadas uh, act more like females so the females have a certain way of of moving their wings around and flitting their wings around and making sounds right uh, that attract males but the males are essentially feminized by the fungus and the males then become attractive to other males and then those males that are not infected come and try to mate with the males that they think are females uh, except that what they're really getting is a whole bunch of spores and they get the spores on them and then those will then eat that particular uh, fungus as well I'm sorry eat that particular cicada as well and so as long as there's a bunch of cicadas around, it's being spread around, well, eventually uh, many of the spores are going to fall to the ground and be present in the environment. And what happens then is the grubs potentially, uh, come, when they emerge and fall to the ground and then begin to try to work their way down the ground, they can be infected. And so the ground is full of these spores. And as the, um, the cicadas live in the ground, they can become infected. And then that's why some of them, when they reemerge in 17 or 16 years, uh, I guess 17 years later, they're going to, some of them are going to be infected and they then are going to start the spreading process again in order to fill the environment with a whole bunch of spores, which will infect the next generation and so forth. All right. Um, and so it's a rather, you know, it's one of the more, um, gruesome life cycles uh, and that's why it's often in the news because it's just sort of like uh, a, well this is just totally crazy and and it is remarkable biologically speaking as a biologist the genetic mechanisms and control mechanisms that uh, allow this particular life cycle must be highly coordinated uh, in terms with respect to the fungus all right so now that's just the introduction into the weird zombie fungus that infects um, 17 and 13 year cicadas. All right, so to the abstract, all right, to the paper. Now this is actually just a, what we'll call a, a note, all right? This isn't a full-fledged uh, research article. What it is is the American Society for Microbiology has a, an, a place that will publish resource announcements. And in this case, uh, this group of authors uh, from Stangic uh, et al., they are announcing to the world that they have a database, all right, available for anyone to now download and use if they want to understand this particular fungus any better. And what it is is an announcement that they have finished the draft, which is like the... Uh, uh, well, they're going to call it more than just a, a rough draft. They're going to call it a draft of the entire genome of this particular fungus. So not of the of the cicada, but of the fungus that's attacking this particular cicada. And that fungus is called Massospora cicadinina, or cicadina. Um, and as you can see from the title, it's an obligate fungal parasite of 13- and 17-year-old cicadas. All right, so there's their sexy title. I mean, really, this is completely appropriate in scientific literature, right? It's saying uh, exactly what's available. It's an improved. They've actually done another genome several years back, and now they've done an, uh, a second genome, but they've used some new technology, new sequencing technology, because it's always improving, and they filled in a lot of gaps, and now they said that we're a lot closer to having, like, a full-blown sequence of this particular fungus. And a lot of people are interested in the uh, maybe... Uh, you know, the mechanisms of how this particular fungus controls its subject, how it zombieizes it, right? 
Uh, and so here's this database. You can now mine it. Anybody else could mine it and find out, find interesting stuff about the world from that. All right, so look down there at the bottom. There's the abstract. This, since it's just a note, doesn't have much of an abstract. Uh, a 1.488 gigabyte, or I'm sorry, gigabase. That's billion bases, all right? 1 billion 488 million base pair genome sequence. So that's what they're claiming the, the size of the genome is of this particular fungus. Was assembled for the fungus Massospora cicadina, uh, an obligate parasite of periodical cicadas. All right, that's first sentence, right, descriptive. Here's what they did. The, and they're, they're, they note one interesting um, observation they make from this particular um, uh, genome, right? And that is the Magia cicada cicadina genome has experienced massive expansion via transposable elements, TEs, which account for 92% of the genome. So 92% of the genome are transposable elements. Uh, you might call that repetitive DNA. Those are, uh, most of them are retro transposons, things that are jumping genes, uh, stuff that's moved around, copied itself in the genome. And a whopping 92% of the genome of this fungus is just these particular elements. That doesn't mean that 8% of the genome is coding sequence, in other words, codes for particular genes that have particular jobs to do. Uh, it means those genes, the the coding sequence that makes proteins must be in that last 8% of the genome, but it's probably much less than that because there are other elements to genomes as well, including uh, spacer sequences, introns, and so forth uh, that make up other non-coding sequences. But 92% of it is just this one type of DNA. Um, all right, so but wait a second, we'll get to that in a moment because that is one of my messages is about the transposons. But let's wait until we talk about the genome just a little bit more. Uh, here is the single table from the paper and it is just the, the spec sheet uh, for the genome. And what they're doing here is they're, let me get my pen out. They're comparing uh, the original sequence they did from one strain of this fungus uh, with the current strain of the fungus. And I just want to point out that, hey, this one came uh, from Brood 5 from 2016 in Ohio. Brood 5 is, I said, that's the one I'm familiar with uh, because I saw those particular cicadas uh, come out uh, in my neighborhood. And then the, the most recent sequence uh, of the fungus comes from a uh, an infected cicada from the 2019 brood eight. And as I said before, uh, the last time you've probably heard about the cicadas, the 17 year cicadas is brood 10, right? You can think of the different broods as essentially different populations. Um, and so those are breeding populations, right? Because, you know, 17 years later, brood, there's brood seven, you know, sorry, brood 10. And because brood five isn't around, they don't really have an opportunity to mate with each other. Uh, and then there's brood eight, and geographically, sometimes they're they're separated. Like this population is one that comes up in the Kentucky area or somewhere in more southwest southeast. Uh, and brood ten was like in a little more north, but sometimes they overlap with the same populations. Um, but then those different broods don't interact very much with each other, at least not sexually, right? Not being able to exchange genetic information. Uh, and this is one of the ways that uh, potentially some of those broods might be speciating over time, but I digress, uh, right? Because they have, they are separated genetically, uh, potentially over many, many thousands of years. They have not had any communi genetic communication with each other since they're off cycle um, with each other. Uh, yeah, what I, what I really want to stress here is down here they have genome size. So they determine from uh, brood five, a 770, 766 million base pair genome for that uh, particular fungus. But what they're seeing now is this 1,488,880,000 base pair genome. Now, they're claiming that these two are the same fungus because it, it has all the same morphological appearance uh, from brood five versus brood eight. And then brood 10 appears to also be the same fungus affecting that particular brood as well. So why the big difference? Because that's uh, twice the size. One of the differences is 
uh, different sequencing technology. So uh, where are we at here? Right here, aluminum high seek uh, versus aluminum Nova Seek 6000 Oxford Nanopore. Yeah, I'm not gonna spend time telling you what the differences are between those two different seek te technologies, except to say generically, <laughs> the, the newer ones on the right-hand side uh, can read longer, uh, more base pairs at one time, uh, and also read a lot more base pairs overall, right? So they, they got something like 20 billion uh, base pairs of sequence uh, minimally uh, for these particular runs. and that allowed them to see all the what we call the repetitive DNA. It's hard to sequence repetitive DNA because it's hard to identify how many repeats there are if you're only reading small segments. All right, so if you read larger segments, you can get an idea of like, oh yeah, there are this many repeats. And so probably the 776, 766 million base pair uh, estimate for the genome size was a gross underestimate because they missed a lot of those repeats. But it doesn't necessarily mean that that genome was 1,488,000,000. Um, you know, it might have been, uh, you know, maybe in that particular brood, the genome is 100 million base pairs different in size, or maybe even 300 million base pair in difference in size. Those are large differences, all right? It could be 20, 25% difference in terms of overall genome size. I find that really fascinating, and what that tells us is that there can be in a tremendous amount of variation in genome size. Much of that genome size comes from the, either the shrinking or expanding of the genome, almost surely because of transposable elements, right? So one population might have a copy of this genome that has then gone on, gone, has had an incredible ex increase increased expansion of transposable elements. In other words, they're active elements right now that are copying themselves and making more redundant pieces of the genome over time. Uh, and it's just filling the whole genome with what we might colloquially call uh, junk DNA only because that particular DNA doesn't seem to serve any specific purpose uh, in terms of the life cycle and the success of that particular fungus. After all, if you can take 300 million base pairs of the genome out and the fungus still looks the same, acts the same, does the same things, then obviously that 300 million base pairs of, ge base pairs of genome wasn't doing much <laughs> right, in terms of, of having any functional purpose uh, there. Uh, and that brings me to uh, point number one uh, that I want to make out of uh, this particular abstract. So the thing that the abstract is missing is it said that it was 1.44 billion base pairs uh, of genome. And what it doesn't say anywhere in the paper, which is just a two-page paper, it doesn't say that this is the largest fungal genome yet reported. I think that's pretty interesting. I would have made a big deal about that. I don't know if the authors weren't aware of that. I know in one of the um, press releases of somebody talking about this paper, they spoke about this being the largest genome. And uh, so that made me go back and try to remember like how big are genomes? And maybe you wonder like, well, how, how does that compare to other organisms, All right? Human beings are in the, for one copy of our genome, we have two copies of our genome, uh, at, you know, as diploids, but as one copy of our genome, we have a little over 3 billion base pairs. So this genome of this little fungus is about a third of the size, maybe a little bit more than a third of the size of a human genome. Um, impressive. But let's look down here at fungi, and you'll see that uh, this is just a map showing typical sizes of genomes for a variety of different kinds of organisms. And uh, this would be uh, down here. This is in the, well, let's, let's start over here. Here's mammals, right? And 10 to the sixth kilobases would be, this is where you have 1 billion right here. This would be 10 billion, uh, and this is 100 billion base pairs over here. I can't write. 100 billion base pairs. So down here we'd have, uh, that's a billion, this is 100 million, and this is 10 million. And now here we have one million. Um, and there are viruses that have up to a million base pairs, but most of them are actually below the million, right? 29,000 base pairs for coronavirus, for example. And so human beings here, about, you know, several billion base pairs in size. 
I just see insects have a wide range. Plants are very notable in that they range anywhere from several hundred million base pairs up to over a hundred billion base pairs. Um, so they have massive, massive genomes, far larger, 10 times the size of human beings in some cases. Um, but down here we have fungi, and the fungal range was just in the tens of millions, right? Tens of millions of base pairs. And then there are a few reported that had, I know before, uh, a little over 100 million base pairs. But right now we're talking about uh, this particular genome would be sitting right in here, right? 1.5 billion base pairs. Uh, in other words, on the order of what a lot, a lot of complex uh, multicellular animals are. Um, but of course, what is most of that genome? Most of that genome is just repetitive stuff. So a really large genome. And one question you might ask is, why such a large genome? Right, why have such a massive genome? Now, the obvious reason it has a large genome is because of the repetitive elements in it, right? These transposable elements. Uh, and so the size can be explained by many, 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 many times copying these transposable elements and then just they proliferate in the genome, making the genome very large. But that doesn't really explain, that, that's a partial explanation. That's kind of like, okay, here's a mechanism for how they got large. But why would the fungus allow such a large genome? Shouldn't there be a trade-off? Shouldn't there be some kind of negative consequence to having such a large genome? Well, there are. I mean, it, a genome is expensive to have, right? You have to copy all that sequence. Uh, and that can be energetically expensive. It also can be messier, right? Because you just have a, a lot more string inside the cell that you have to sort out as you're, you're copying your entire nucleus in order to make more copies of it to make more cells, right? So th there can be a lot of things, drawbacks to having a large genome size. The positive of a large genome size is potentially you have more space, all right, for uh, encoding genetic information, which might allow you to do more complex, interesting tasks. But in the case of this fungi, although it sounds really complex in terms of its life cycle, it's still not a very complex organism, all right? It's, it's, it's a very simple uh, organism uh, and not all that different than a lot of other fungi, which have much smaller genomes. And most of its genome are these repetitive elements for which it's hard to imagine them having any sort of higher functional purpose. Uh, adding really complicated uh, tasks or uh, abilities to the organism. And so it simply just has a really large genome. How does it get away with that massive genome that it isn't really using? How does it get away with that inefficiency? There is one, uh, actually there's multiple theories for you know, what um, causes genomes to either be small or large. In other words, what, what influences genome size? What natural selection, uh, environmental things are going on that would then pressure genomes to either increase in size or decrease in size. Uh, and one theory for organisms such as this that are essentially parasites, right? They're living inside of another organism, is that they're given a free ride. And uh, I think, uh, I'm gonna just go to plants for a moment because I, I worked on parasitic plants. So plants that parasitize other plants. And they have really crazy wild genomes with very different, say, GC content. Uh, they have low gene content, meaning they have a lot of extra stuff in the genome, uh, a lot of repetitive elements and so forth. And so they don't seem to care about this increase. In other words, they're not working. They don't appear to have mechanisms that are trying to get rid of this extra stuff. Uh, and one of the theories is that they don't care because they have plenty of energy, right? They live in a host that is giving them all the energy they need. So this is the energetic uh, hypothesis. Uh, and the energy hypothesis is that if you're not concerned about where your energy source comes from, um, then, and, and it's, it's like free energy is present all the time, then you're not, you don't care about wasting energy. Right? So you can expand different parts of the organism such and be wasteful, I guess you could say. You're not going to be efficient. You don't have to be efficient because you're a parasite and the host is providing all the energy for you. I know. 
you can go to the extreme at some extreme of course it's going to become detrimental because if you're too if you're taking too much energy from your host the host will die and then you will die and that will be the selectal selectional pressure put on you to like not expand your genome uh, or other portions of the organism to be too large uh, however um, in most cases of parasitism uh, the parasites don't kill the host, in which case they're just living off of free energy all the time. And so one theory is that I, they're living off the cicada and they don't have a concern about uh, their genome size. And so the, the transposal elements just go crazy, copy themselves, and there isn't any alternative mechanism that's suppressing uh, the uh, transposal elements or trying to get rid of portions of the genome in order to uh, make it more efficient. The other, you know, if you think about efficient genomes, think about something like the mitochondria. All right, the mitochondria has a very small genome with almost no gaps between the genes, and so it's almost all protein coding sequence uh, in, in an animal mitochondria. And so they're super efficient, and you want your mitochondria to be super efficient, right? It's your energy producing organelle, and you want the genome in it to be as efficient as possible therefore not using up extra energy. And so it has uh, been honed to the point, right? It's been selected to the point of being uh, incredibly efficient with respect to protein coding sequence or coding sequences versus non-coding sequence. And in the case of this fungus, it's gone hog wild with non-coding sequence. And 92% of its genome is clearly non-coding sequence. Uh, and then probably even some portion of that other 8%, I'm gonna guess another 4%. So maybe uh, probably even more than that. Uh, I would imagine that uh, I haven't, I have now just reminded me, I haven't looked at the paper enough to count up. I don't think they say, I know they talk about the number of total genes being like 9,000 genes. Uh, but I didn't look at what the total amount of coding space is. But I'm going to guess it's probably less than 1% of the overall genome of this fungus. All right, so big picture here is that genomes are different between, genome sizes vary greatly between organisms. There is a general trend toward very simple organisms have small genomes, and more complex organisms have larger genomes. And that intuitively makes sense that you uh, you would need more genetic you need more genetic material in order to do more complicated tasks. However, um, larger organisms also have a large amount of additional um, genetic code. Well, maybe I'll put that word. Uh, they have a large number of nucleotide bases, right? Potential coding space they aren't necessarily using, um, and they're less efficient and they're a little sloppier with their genomes than are smaller organisms that uh, live in highly competitive environments. All right, that's point number one. Point number two, all right, so if I were to rewrite the abstract, right, make the alternate abstract for this uh, article, I would have mentioned the genome size being a record breaker and I would have stressed a little bit more of the repetitive element portion of this. And so here we have uh, near the, uh, this is the second last paragraph of the paper, the genome uh, strain, the particular strain is a significant improvement over the previously sequenced strain, similar to the 1.018 gigabyte rust genome. So there is another genome of a, um, a rust genome. So rust is a, a fungus that attacks things like uh, wheat plants. All right, it's a real bad pest. Um, and it's also, you can think of it as, parasitic on um, uh, particular plants. And it has a very large genome. And there's a soybean rust that has a very large genome as well, a 1.25 gigabyte. So those are two also highly unusual uh, genomes in terms of their size compared to the typical fungus, which is only in the 30 to 100 million base pairs uh, in size. That's what most fungi are. All right, far simpler. and. Um, so these two genes, the rust genomes, over a billion base pairs as well, but not quite the 1.44 billion. Um, they also contain enormous amounts of transposable elements. And so they're saying in this particular genome, we have 92%. That's 1,369,000,000 base pairs, all right? Nucleotides of its genome 
are transposable elements. And of that, 73% of that is one particular type of transposon. Um, and so when I say one particular type or strain of transposon, that is a particular transposon that has uh, two elements on each side of the, the sequence. Um, and then two genes that are inside of there that are the, the, the coding sequences for being able to tell it how to copy itself and move and splice itself into another location. Uh, and 73% of them are just that particular uh, transpose. They're they are almost carbon copies of each other in which they've copied themselves into the genome in many, many different locations over and over and over again. Wow, so this genome is just chock full of extra stuff. I said, I uh, estimated from the size of, I looked up that particular transposable element and it's several thousand base pairs long. And if you figure out 73% of it, there must be well over a million, probably closer to 5 million long terminal repeats of this particular transposable element um, in that particular genome. And sure, Hey, you know, um, some of you might be aware that there are no names, please. Some individuals out there that suggest that like all parts of a genome have, you know, are functional, meaning they, they serve some purpose beyond just their existence. All right. And what they mean by that is that, oh, well, they're they're code. They somehow code for something. They are actually doing something. Maybe we don't understand what they're doing. But these are we're talking about a million identical pieces of sequence or almost identical because of course when they copy themselves they might make a mistake here and there so there's going to be small differences between them but they're identifiable as the same unit of dna a long terminal repeat that repeats over and over and over and over and over again um, and yes some of those terminal repeats if they had the right mutation um, can be we'll say co-opted by the organism uh, over time and made into some kind of useful product that might actually be doing something for this particular organism, right? That's that's uh, that's one way that new genes may be born, right? They may be uh, mutations that suddenly give function to a, a particular long terminal repeat, and the organism can take advantage of that in particular environments. Uh, but that's not going to happen to all of them, and there isn't any evidence that these organisms are actually using the vast majority of these for any particular purpose and the one or two cases out of millions which might take on function maybe not today but maybe sometime in the future or if we find one that has some function now probably didn't have function in the past and found a function because of some mutation that occurred in that particular location um, these are going to be one-offs these are going to be rare events and they're going to represent an extremely small por small portion of the genome. So, in fact, these organisms are only using a tiny fraction of their genomes um, uh, for the you know what makes them what they are and what they do. Um, yeah, these are all pictures of the 2015 brood of cicadas. Uh, I didn't see any of the uh, I didn't see any with rotten butts. All right, when I when I looked at a lot of 2015 of cicadas and took pictures of them, uh, but apparently the 2015 or sorry 2016 brood five uh, did have cases of this fungus attacking them. So how successful is the fungus? I mean, apparently in some areas there are large percentages of cicadas, and large percentages would be like one or two or three percent of the cicadas uh, are infected by this fungus. Um, that's not near enough to stop these these cicadas, right? They come out in the hundreds of millions. All right, that's, their, that's one of their strategies is they overwhelm all of the different predators, all the different types of organisms in ways that they might be killed. So sure, birds eat a lot of them, but they can't possibly eat hundreds of millions of them. They gorge themselves and then they, they walk by the next cicada because they can't handle eating another. And so as a, as a strategy for long-term survival, cicadas simply produce so many that even if 2% or 3% or even 5% of the population were to be wiped out because they can't reproduce um, and um, they're killed eventually by this fungus. Um, yeah, they're going to continue on, all right? They're going to uh, have overcome this particular obstacle uh, set before them.
So for the present, until the next fungus is found that has an even larger genome, this is the record-breaking uh, fungal genome in terms of size. And the other thing to remember about it is, although it has a huge genome, it's probably not doing any more with its genome than another typical fungus is doing with its genome that only has 50 million base pairs in its genome. It's not about the size of your genome. It's like how you use it that matters. All right, that's it for the alternate abstract for today. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.